Go ahead and get started because it's 11, past 11 now. Welcome everyone for joining us. I recognize a few names and faces who have been joining us every week. This is our third um, artist Q&A sponsored by eQuilter.com for Quilt National 21, which is on view at the Dairy Barn until uh, Labor Day, which is um, September 6th, I believe. <laughs> um, that weekend we'll be having a um, closing reception on the Friday of Labor Day weekend that we all invite you to attend. And then on that Saturday will be a artist reunion, called National Artist Reunion, which will be a lot of fun. Um, today we will be speaking with Robbie Eklo, Jean Howard, if she um, joins us a little late, Michael Ross and Irene Roderick. If you have questions for the artists, please drop them in the chat box and I'll read them as they come in or as appropriate. Um, you can ask a question for the individual artist or for the group as a whole. Um, also on view at the Dairy Burn Art Center is Flora, Fauna, and Landscape by Chile Quilting and the um, Textile Artists of Southeast Ohio. It's a collaborative project um, featuring beautiful quilts made by those artists, and I see a few of them on the meeting today too, so welcome. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Robbie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, if you stop sharing your screen, I can see the gallery. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Ah, thank you. Okay, see, I couldn't even see what. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm okay. I'm usually good at Zoom. Oops. Anyway, I'm Robbie Eklo. I live in Omaha. Um, I'm in my studio. Here's all my dyed fabric. And um, that's it. That's all I got to say. Hi, thanks for being here. Irene. <laughs> thank you for having me. Did you say me? Yeah, hi. Hey, everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces. It's good to see everybody this morning. Haven't seen some of you in a long time and some of you I see a lot, so, but cool. Um, I was just gonna kind of give a little speech kind of thing if that's what uh, you want me to do, Holly. Well, go ahead and just introduce yourself and I'll introduce Michael and then the three of you can- um, Okay, little... uh, yeah, my name's Irene Roderick. I'm in Austin, Texas. Um, sitting in my tiny house and um, glad to be here. Thanks. Hey, Michael, how are you? Hi, good, Holly, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Good. Um, my name is Michael Ross, and thanks everybody for joining in today. I live in New Hope, Pennsylvania, on the eastern edge of the state, right on the border with New Jersey. And I'm sitting in my um, cutting and sewing room up here with my design wall, um, covered up at the moment because it's a mess. But I'll show you some pictures in just a little bit of the different rooms that I use in my house for dyeing, my long arm quilting, and also for cutting and sewing. Great, thanks. Robbie, would you like to, um, you know, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna pull my screen back up so people can see. Uh, oh, Jean's here. Hi, Jean. <laughs> Sorry, I just emailed you. Oh, you're on, you're muted. I'm mute. There. Sorry <laughs> about that. I was thinking it was 11 my time and not oh. 11 your time. So, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thanks for being here. Um, if, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still getting over my cold. I had a, it started on Friday when we last talked, and then now it's just I've gone through the whole thing. I'm on the tail end. <laughs> Hopefully, next Friday I'll have my voice back. <laughs> but Robbie, would you like to um, talk about your piece? I'm going to screen share so we can all. Okay. See. Oh, good. So you're going to be looking not at me anyway. What was that? Oh, I can see Michael. Um, can you hear me all right? You could hear me, right? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. I sound like I'm 100 years old. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. So. Um, well, I fuse all my quilts and usually I draw the design on uh, fusible with paper and then fuse it to the fabric and then I cut it out and I put it together. And in this case, um, instead I used Misty Fuse and I used, um, I think freezer paper, I ran something through my inkjet 
to print the, the design on this. And then I worked from there. And what this was is it, back in 2010, I was having spinal surgery and I had to sit around in this um, Miami J collar and I couldn't turn my head or do anything for several months. So I sat at my work table and I could watch TV because it was <coughs> straight ahead. And I, I did, um, I just used a compass and pencils and I drew circles and then filled in the space. And it was a, before Zen, before I discovered Zen tangling. So anyway, so I, and then I colored it in with acrylic markers on some fabric in a small scale. And then I decided to, when I decided to make this quilt, I just took it to um, uh, FedEx and had them blow up the, the uh, drawing to about 12 by 18. And then I scanned it and then I drew it in Adobe Illustrator and took it to the guy who does my printing. And it turned out I could have just brought him the color image and he would have just printed the whole thing in color in the first place. But um, anyway, so I worked on this. And in the meantime, we were moving. Well, I, I, I designed it in 2010, then I forgot about it for a while. And then uh, in 2017, we were moving to Omaha to be near our grandsons. And we had a tiny apartment and I started working on it there. And then um, I guess, uh, well, I was crabby in January, speak for some of them, the inauguration in 2017 and then just politics and everything was bothering me. And then we had a really cold January here. So I, uh, the year I finished, so I named it Red January and it's all a dyed fabric. And you're gonna have to tell me when 10 minutes is up. Um, and this here's, oh, you can't see anything. Okay, did I speak enough about my piece? Are you? Probably I can see you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can see you. No. Okay. It, well, there's, I all I can see is the shared screen. So there's, unless I try pressing that and see what happens. Nope. Um, so I'm using, I'm using an iPad instead of my laptop. So I'm kind of confused and I'm usually at home in front of my Mac. Anyway, so behind me is all my dyed fabric. I have a studio in the uh, Hot Shops Art Center where I am now. It's in Omaha, Nebraska. It's in an old Serta mattress factory. And uh, the Hot Shops has a glass forge, a pottery studio, people weld. There's a meeting of some sort in the common room that's kitty corner to my studio. So I have the door locked now so people don't come in. But normally visitors to the art center come in my studio and talk to me and ask me about my long arm. And my studio here is on the first floor in the main, kind of on the main drag. And the reason they offered the studio to me here is because I talk so much that they can bring visitors in. And so usually I talk and then Tim says, okay, we're done now, <laughs> we have to leave. So um, it's kind of the same. So I'm going, to, I'd like to, do you wanna see some of my studio? Yeah? Yes. Okay, yeah. all right, so um, and I'm guessing, cause I, all I can see is the, can you, can you stop sharing the screen for a minute, Holly, so I can? Yeah. Thanks, I'm sorry that I'm having a technical challenge usually. I don't no tell problem. my husband. Okay, so, oh, this is great. Okay, so here is, well, here's my dye fabric. And then more stuff, I gotta lift it up. Okay, then you see my blue refrigerator. It's very cute. Mm -hmm. People really like it. So little kids come in my studio and they look at this skeleton. It's made out of um, milk cartons. I can't get it to show. Anyway, and they ignore the quilts and then old ladies come in and, and admire my Ikea rugs instead of my quilts. So this is the, one of my working walls. I have, so this studio is 28 feet by 25. So behind me is a working wall. That wall is probably 15 feet and it's made out of um, designer tech bulletin boards that I bought in Illinois and Wisconsin and Omaha and kind of cleaned them out. They're 32 by 48 and they're nailed up on the wall with the sheet covering them. So I can pin on there. And then over here, 
in a minute, is my working wall, which is, I'm gonna go over here. I can't figure out where the camera is. Oops. Okay, now I can't even see me. It's one of those days. Can you see my working wall? Uh -huh. Okay, so that's my, my working wall that I'm working on. Actually, that's an old quilt. I put it up there to look nice. Um, the quilt that I finished, I wanted to take pictures and I realized I put my Bernina in front of it and I'm so short that I can't use that wall to take pictures. So I'm always kind of moving things around. And um, there's my, can you see that one? on that? Give me a second to see if I can find myself. This is, now I feel bad for people using iPads because I can't, I can't find myself. Oh, here, okay, sorry, I won't touch the screen. So here's my long arm. And I, so I put my, my long arm is in front of a window so people can look in and I'm gonna put a sign on it saying, don't tap on the glass because people tap on the glass and I'm gonna sew through my finger one of these days. And I have the, um, the guys that own this place, Tim and Ed, think it's funny to come in and sneak up behind me and scare me. And <laughs> they're gonna think it's funny to like sew through my hand. But, um, and then I, I store my quilts. Let's see, down. Here's some of my quilt storage. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of messy because I rearranged. I turned my long arm around last week. It was facing into the room and I turned it the other way because little, I didn't think little kids could see over the rails to see my quilt. Right now there's no quilt on it. I'm going to show you something too. Hang on. What is this looking at? Oh, I didn't even recognize my own quilt. Okay, you'll all seem very polished compared to me. This is, okay, here we go. So I'm so short that I can't reach the thread rack behind my long arm like, like nor a normal person. So this is a superior thread rack Velcroed on top. Oh. And I, so I could just put my thread here and I work at the front. And then um, I also wanted to show you something else. So when I work on my long arm, I sit on this chair and well, you can't see the chair. Anyway, I sit on a tall chair and I have to climb up on a stool to get on there. And then I smack the uh, pedals around to advance the quilts with a ruler and everybody thinks that's highly, I'm really a source of entertainment for <laughs> a lot of people around here. So anyway, so I have these, these buttons and I can make my long arm rails go back and forth. They're nurses call buttons. And so the, the, the cool thing about the hot shops is that there are, there are a lot of, and so we all can collect on different things. And someone is, one of the other artists is a painter and she, I've shown her the quote national stuff. I've been bugging her for a couple of years but she is getting a lot of success as a painter. She's young and she still wants to make quilts. So she's gonna come in and do some paintings and mount them on the long arm. And uh, so we're, we're working on that. And it's really nice because if I need to borrow something, I can go bug one of the other artists or they'll come in and ask for scissors. And then I have to quiz them on what they're gonna cut. They're left-handed or right-handed. And they have to go through this long questionnaire before I hand them the scissors because, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of scissors. So, and uh, there are four quilters in this building and the building is open 24 seven for the artists. And during uh, COVID, the doors were locked, but you could still bring people in and we could come in, but it was very nice to be able to just have this place to come because um, Brian likes to watch sports and after a couple months of it, I don't. So I can come here and this is my, my Heidi place. Cool. So it's very nice. Well, thanks for that. 
I like the innovation that you've created to make it work for you. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's uh, the floor is completely covered with rugs because it's con it's a concrete. So this this building is um was built at the turn of the last century, <clears throat> so there's a lot of weird stuff going on in in the building itself. So you have to kind of put up with it. Neat. Well, thank you, um, Jean. Would you like to tell us about your oops, let's your piece that's included in Quilt National 21 and yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, I live in rural Missouri on 12 acres of shade trees and flowering trees and shrubs and flowers and vegetable gardens. And I've always enjoyed creating art and sewing. Um, I've taken some classes with Nancy Crow to help me develop my art because my original college degree was uh, nutrition, which has a lot of chemistry and biology, but not any art to it. So now that I'm almost completely retired, I'm uh, working more on my art. So I love working with colors, as you can see by this quilt. Sometimes I think, and my daughter tells me that I use too many colors in a quilt. Uh, I work improvisationally, usually mostly with curves. And um, I just think they're more interesting and, and beautiful than straight lines, I guess. So when I make a new quilt, like I made uh, this Re Harlem Renaissance dance, I start with a motif or just a central figure and I make a block and then um, I and then I just go from there. I don't really have planned out exactly what I'm going to do before I do it. Uh, I do use patterns, so that part's planned out. I draw out the figure on a piece of tissue paper um, and then make a pattern from that. So each piece of paper that I cut out is the exact piece size. So I draw around that and then I know where to sew. Um, and so that's how I make my quilts and that's how it doesn't drive me crazy when the curves don't match the place where they're supposed to match. So it cuts out a lot of frustration for me to do it that way. Uh, and, and I am a little bit more sure of the end product than when I, when I do it that way. So I machine piece all my quilts almost exclusively, and then I also quilt them on my mid-arm quilter. Uh, Harlem Renaissance Dance was made just like that. So I finished the center sections first, and then I moved to the, the outside sections, and um, the name came from, I, took, I don't usually name my quilts until I'm finished with them. And so um, I took this quilt top to my daughter's work. So my daughter's an artist she, and she's made a business of it. So she did better than I did at it. <laughs> but she has uh, artists working for her in her business. And uh, I took it down to her shop and someone said, oh, that reminds me of uh, Harlem Renaissance colors. And I remembered then that I had seen an art exhibit of Harlem Renaissance art right before I made this quilt. And so then, you know, then I realized that the colors that I use were pretty much from those paintings that I saw. So then that's when I named it Harlem Renaissance Dance. Um, let's see, my latest series, I mean, I do piece block by block usually, but I've just started a series where I have uh, drawn out the entire thing um, and then cut out the pattern pieces to that. So I was doing this, uh, the type of quilting with the Harlem Renaissance dance and the one that you see behind me that's a work in progress and then I watched a uh, an artist talk by Sheila Frampton Cooper and I said why am I fooling with these just random figures why don't I do something that I really love and work with um, botanicals so I love plants and I love watching them grow and I love all the colors in them so my latest quilt series I'm going to turn my screen and hope that you can see it because I can't see what I'm showing you, but uh, the one on the wall here, oops, there. That one is number three in a series. Thanks. So I drew out that entire pattern and then uh, cut it out and it was kind of a nightmare to do, but I really <laughs> like doing the series. So, so I'm gonna, when I finish the nightmare behind me, I'm gonna start on doing the botanical series again. Um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of figuring out where pieces are gonna fit. So um, I know that fusing would be easier, but I just, I like the machine piecing quality to, to it. So, okay, do you wanna see my sewing space? Let's see. 
I'm on my iPad, which just makes everything different for me than my regular computer. Oh, there, I can see, I can switch the camera around there. So um, there's that quilt. And then up on this wall, I have some other quilts that I've done and I've got a great view outside to the flowering trees. And then um, I have a bookshelf full of quilting books that I hardly look at anymore. <laughs> and then just a few random things, a closet full of stuff. And um, I don't know, just random art on the wall because this is a space I can do whatever I want with. And so um, there. And so uh, it's not big enough, like the quilt behind me, I'm trying to make into a seven foot by seven foot. And that wall is just, I mean, it covers the entire wall. So when I work on something bigger like that, I usually end up taking it to my, the lower level of my house, which has a big family room and a ping pong table, which I do a lot of cutting on. So uh, I might have to move this one down there. All right, thank you. Um, I am resending the link because it looks like some people got the wrong link or something. So if you, we could just take a pause real quick while I get this email out. Um, sorry. Sure. And then um, Irene and Michael will hear from you. Just one moment. Okay. So I'll shout out to Peggy Black for calling me and saying, Jean, are you going to get on this Zoom call? And I said, no, it's at 11. My time, she said, no, it's at 11 Eastern time. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. Well, you're more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just sent the email out. Um, looks like we have 38 people on here. So it looks like lots of people got the correct one. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to screen share now. Again, let me get out of my email though. There we go. Okay, back to our regular programming. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> All right, Irene, could you please tell us a little more about yourself and Corona Spring? I will, thank you very much and welcome to all of you. Um, I came to quilting rather later in life um, because I was always a painter. Started painting when I was 10 and I've painted pretty much everything that would hold still long enough for me to paint it from furniture to murals, to motorcycle helmets, to needlepoint designs. But then in 2015, I um, needed a new bedspread and I went online and I discovered the work of Nancy Crow and Gwen Marston and Denise Schmidt. And I thought, I need to learn how to do this. These are cool. So I signed up for a beginning quilt class and fell in love with fabric and also with the process. I never really was exposed to quilting. Uh, quilting didn't run in my family. My mother didn't quilt, my grandmother, my aunts, nobody. And so I, I really wasn't familiar with it. Um, so I didn't know about the rules. So I went home and I built a design wall and I just started kind of painting with fabric on my design wall. And what I do when I start a new piece, I have no expectations, I have no plan. I usually don't even have a palette and uh, I put one element on my design wall and I kind of step back and study it and look at it and make another element and add to it and do that uh, until the quilt is done. So it's just one step at a time responding to what's on the wall right in front of me. And um, it's very intuitive and it's very fluid and I just kind of let it happen. And I'm a firm believer that whatever is kind of in front of us and around us um, kind of show up in, in, our, in our work. And Corona Spring was made pretty early in the pandemic last year when they were showing all the pictures of the virus on TV. So the, the spheres with the sticky out things. Um, and um, I'm a firm believer that that's what these circles are. And I did about five in this series. And, they all kind of have these circles with sticky out things on them. 
Um, it was also springtime in Texas, which is fleeting. Um, and uh, so I was kind of surprised at the colors, but the colors are kind of the colors of the poppies and things that show up here on my street in the springtime briefly. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about that was on the news a lot was the pandemic was global. And so I started trying to think, well, we're, and we kept hearing, well, we're all in this together. And so I was thinking, you know, what else do we all do as humans? What pulls us all together? You know, something nice, something good, something to think about. And so I thought, you know, I did some research and I started thinking about Everybody, every human being since the beginning of time, every civilization has made and left their marks. And I mean, from the beginning of time, from prehistoric, we've all had arms, we've all had hands, we all have opposable thumbs. And so we all kind of make similar marks. And I did a lot of research and went back to the beginning of time across you know, all nationalities and started kind of making records of all the different marks through um, beading and on, you know, cave drawings and um, paintings. And there are a lot of similar things. And so um, to add another layer to this quilt, I got some fabric markers and I started making those marks on top of the quilt just to kind of add a little more interest and a little more kind of international and um, pulling us all together into one piece. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about the quilt. I can show you, I work and live in a tiny house and I, after last week, everybody was showing their studios. I thought, oops. So I kind of put together a brief, very brief, cause it's a very small space um, PowerPoint that I can show you that in just a second. Um, so I'm living in this tiny house still. I've been here eight, 18 months. I quilt all day long. I pretty much am teaching workshops. I do have um, kind of a confession to make my last five quilts. I have been kind of trying out a new technique and I have been making sketches on my iPad with Procreate and then trying to see if I can actually make them into quilts. Um, I'm on my fifth one and it will probably be the last because I really miss the adrenaline rush and the problems of actually designing and seeing a quilt kind of come to life in front of me instead of quilting by numbers, which is what I kind of call this because I kind of know what it's going to look like. It's more of an engineering challenge than a design challenge. And I'm really missing the design challenge. So just putting that out there because a lot of people said, you're not dancing with the wall anymore. I'm going, not at the moment, but um, I'm going to be dancing with the wall as soon as I get the one that's behind me off. Well, not this one, because this one's the another one in the series, just like Corona Spring. Um, so I'll share my screen. And I'm going to show you this really kind of silly, brief little thing. So here is uh, me sitting in front of my tiny house. Come on, slideshow. Um, it's got iron green on the railing. Um, you walk inside, I have a Bernina sit down machine. This is where I sleep. I'm standing in the middle of the room and just turning in circles. So that's my closet, my kitchen. Here are the birds by the front wall. Um, we're kind of um, more birds. Um, back to the Q20 and my um, entertainment system. And here's my design wall and we are back to the sleeping area. So that's pretty much my life right there. So that's it, thank you. Nice, thank you for sharing Irene. Michael, would you like to speak about um, mutations number 13 and yourself? Yes. <laughs> So this is the 13th in a series that I've been working on for a few years. And in January of last year, I started working on a body of work 
that is going to be shown later this fall. It was supposed to be last fall for my last um, class with Nancy Crow. I'll be finishing up five years of working with her later this year. And this is one of two quilts that I made that were kind of done in this style. And um, this one, I had just start, I had just finished the previous one. And then I learned that a friend across the coast, on the other side of the coast, uh, sorry, the country passed away unexpectedly from um, a heart condition. So I had this kind of planned out and the palette and everything already. And I, but I was going to give myself a week or so before I started. But when I heard that news, I just needed to do something. So I came back into my studio and the first week or so I spent making about half of these units. Everything is improvisationally cut, but the units themselves were trimmed with the ruler. So um, no paper, no nothing like that. And I just put my head down and just started working. So um, generally with the work that I do, I'm more of a non-objective artist. I don't use anything around me that I'm aware of as inspiration. And this particular piece, um, actually what I started in January of last year, I was using one 12 inch square black and white sewn sketch, which I show in the, or it should be in the artist video when that gets released. Right. And I'll talk more about this, like how I did that, but I use that one design as inspiration for, uh, let's see, like five quilts basically. And it spanned, you know, from January to June of last year. So I wanted to challenge myself to see how much I could use one little thing and keep changing the rules, change the palette, et cetera, and see how many pieces I could get out of it. And the one after this, I, I made something after this is very different. And I kind of hit a wall creatively. And so because the class had been deferred to this year and with the shutdown and everything, it really gave me time to start exploring um, more about my work, what was important to me, what I really wanted to do, and things like that. I got into quilting because I love color and working with color. And I came to quilting from a background in knitting. And I'd like to do color knitting, but even I, I do hand, you know, two needle, and also I have machines that I can use. But even with machine knitting with color is more of a challenge. It's not that fast. So I started playing around with quilting. And my main interest first was to learn how to dye fabric so that I could get the colors that I wanted. And I knew from art school, color mixing classes and stuff that I really needed to, I needed to learn how to dye fabric to get a wider range of colors than what was available commercially. So I studied with Carol Soderlund and I've had four classes with her uh, over the last few years. And um, then in my first class with her, I found out that Nancy Crow was starting up her series of classes. So it just, one thing led to another. And that's kind of where I am now. Um, if you want, I can share my screen and give a little progress shot of this one. And then also some about my studio space. So this, uh, let me see. These are out of order. Okay, here's the, the progress picture. So this is about a week or so into making mutations number 13. And my design wall is 96 inches by 96. When I have the two panels put together, you can see the little seam in the center here. And the um, for the most part, this kind of stayed, these pieces pretty much stayed in place the way they are here. I just, I wasn't really sure what I was gonna get with the palette. I was using different value combinations with each of the units. And I just started grouping by color or, and or by value. And then I kind of made a map of this. And because I was trimming everything with the ruler, then I could mathematically create something specifically to the size that needed to fit into this space. And I tried to honor the same value combination from piece to piece as the edges touch, but some of them had to kind of, for a transition, they had to kind of blend. So that's a little bit on the background of Mutations 13. In my studio space, I have a bedroom upstairs that I took over when I started quilting. And so I have these two panels that on one side of the room, when I'm working on something early stages, 
I'll set them over on these side of, on this one side of the room, and then in the center, I have a number of tables put together that let me put out stacks of fabric. It's a cutting table, little ironing thing there, and I can kind of keep things organized by one side or the other. As a side note, what you see here, these strips on the left and then the triangles on the right are the beginnings of a larger piece that is in a new series that I started late last year, early this year. And I'm not really certain of the name of it yet, but I wanted to go back to um, using a ruler and, and not do freehand cutting, which I wanted to kind of just see how that was. And so if on Instagram I, and Facebook, there are a couple of pictures that I posted of two smaller versions doing this technique. And I'm very interested in geometry and I wanted to just see what kind of effects I could create just using a ruler with 45 degree and 90 degree cuts. So this piece is currently um, almost done. And that's why my wall is covered up because there are some funky spots on it and I'm, <laughs> I'm not ready to show it all. So I've now moved these two panels side by side. This is the beginning of starting to lay out some of the strips and the triangles. And this is actually before I had moved my table. So at this point, the wall to the right become that's where the ironing board goes. These other tables get moved over to the background and the sides of the room. And then this cutting table gets pushed to the side. So then it's a completely open view, like I showed you for the mutations number theme, uh, number 13 process picture. So it's it's kind of a tight space and I have to move things around. Um, when I'm working. But again, this panel is 96 inches wide and tall. And at the moment, it's completely covered in fabric with these triangles, um, individual stripped panels, and then individual cut strips and different shapes. So it's a lot of pins and a lot of places, but I want to get it roughed in to just make sure that it works before I start sewing it. And it's going to shrink considerably. I'd like to have it around 90 by 90 when it's done. Um, let's see, then in my basement, I have my die space. So I have on the left one rack with a lot of different um, large jugs that I use for mixing all my dies over here. This table is more of a staging area once the dies are mixed and I hold them in those containers. I have a double sink, lots of five gallon buckets. I have four large capacity washing machines that are portable, so I have to fill these manually and the hose drains gra with gravity into the buckets that are placed under those. And I can do four yards in each washer at a time. And in one day of dyeing, I can, on an easy day, I can do 32 yards of fabric and play around with that. And over here on the right side is my mixing table with all my graduated cylinders and all of that. In the back here are two racks with different supplies. And this rack on the right, you'll see that in the next picture as that's here, and I have a Bernina Q24 on a 12 foot frame. And I'm now getting to the point where I wish I would have gotten the 14 foot frame because my work is getting a little large. And then I have my rack of batting over here. And just to give another perspective on this space, here's a back shot then from the side of the long arm and viewing the, the die space over there. And that's it for, there we go. Sorry, I didn't realize I muted myself. We had two questions that came in while you were speaking. And um, the first one is what fabric do you use when you're dyeing? What fabric? Mm -hmm. I use um, Test Fabrics 419. It's 100% mercerized bleached cotton from a company called Test Fabrics in upstate Pennsylvania. And it's a tight, it's a tight broad cloth, a tightly wovo woven broadcloth, but it's a PFD. So it's, I don't have to scour it or anything. And um, I use that. But, um, also in the mutations for, I've dyed a lot of my own blacks, but for that piece and for a lot of them, I use two different commercial blacks. But other than that, every other color in mutations was hand dyed in those machines. Okay, and then the other question was wondering if those were, if you're using glass or plastic bottles in your dyes? When you're dying, I mean, plastic. 
I do. Um, yeah, I don't want to have anything breaking down there. So um, over the years, I've amassed a collection of those, um, the Bai bottles, B-A-I, that kind of fruit drink, whatever. So I have a lot of those that I've saved. And then I can, if it's a certain measurement that I want in the bottle, I can draw a line on it so I can know, if, you know, to fill up to a certain level and do that. But everything is plastic down there. I have, um, yeah, I don't think I have anything glass down there just because if it falls or breaks, it's just one, one more thing that I'd have to clean up. Mm -hmm. And it gets a little messy on this day. So yeah, there's enough to clean up already. Great. Jean, um, could you please tell us more about the color palette in your piece, your selection process of it? Oh, you're still muted, Jean. <laughs> not used to this. I'm not used to using this new iPad. Um, I like bright colors. And I was trying to use some bright and then some dull to kind of balance it out. I also love to use a variety of colors. So as my daughter says, I don't have to use all the colors in the box, but I just seem to gravitate towards that. Uh, and so I, these were just the colors that struck me at the time. Yeah, thanks, good. This lovely palette. <clears throat> thanks. Um, Robbie, similar question for you. I know you were working off of a sketch um, and making Red January. Um, did you select the colors from the sketch or after you transferred it, um, you know, blew up the sketch? Is that when you made the color selections? Oh, no, I, so when I first did it, I did it on paper and uh, colored with Bic markers. And so when I made the quilt, I tried to match the colors of the fabric to what markers I had been using. And that's why there's a lot of color in there. But usually I design just as a line drawing and then I, I'll see a picture or something and decide you know, what is it that I like about this? And then I just, that's how I pick a palette from, like I did a whole quilt from a beer, a beer sign in a, in a Mexican restaurant we used to go to all the time. And I love the colors. So I had, I have several quilts that use that palette from the, um, whatever beer that was. Anyway, so yes, I picked, I did pick the colors on this ahead of time as I was using the big markers. I feel like colors follow us, like, yeah, in your in your in your home and your life and your art, like I have this repeated um, lavender that I find <laughs> throughout my life, um, and I think that's probably true for everyone. Oh yeah, and when we had so this building has an open house every spring in uh, December, and the first time I participated, a lady came into my studio and I had quilts w literally wall to wall just covered and this lady came in and she said I like your work but I don't like purple do you have anything that's not purple and I looked around and I said and no apparently I really like purple <laughs> and I hadn't really I mean I know I like purple but I didn't know that I put it in every single quilt <coughs> so, and it's still I think that's still pretty well my last quilt I'm looking over at it doesn't have any purple but well maybe she can buy that one <laughs> If she ever comes back. <laughs> um, okay, we have a question for Irene. Do you begin with a bank of elements when you're designing or create the elements one at a time as you see what is needed? I actually make them one at a time. Um, I make one and I put it up and then I decide what's going to be next. And so I never know what the next one's going to be or need. And so I have tried making them ahead of time and putting them together like a jigsaw puzzle and it, I just can't do it. So I basically, and I tend to start right in the center and then just build out. And so I make them as I go, but I don't sew them together until the entire quilt is designed on the wall. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then um, another question for you, could you expand on your decision to return to wall the wall designing um, wall dancing versus the computer design 
Yeah, I mean, I get bored um, with the, you know, the computer design. It's just I know what it's going to look like. And it's just a matter of just making it. And I find that actually more tedious. I mean, what I love about painting and creating is the decisions and seeing it grow and you know the excitement of when something really is working and you get that feeling on the back of your neck your hair stands up and you just go yes this is great when you already have it planned out ahead of time you kind of lose all of that but it's an adrenaline thing also that kind of keeps you going and keeps you trying to and as I build, you know, I can kind of think about where is it going and what is it going to be? And it's always a surprise. And I, I love that process more than just, all right, this is what it's going to be. It's just a matter of making it now. And so to me, then that becomes very tedious. And so I just like the joy of creating as I go. Good. Um, Michael. So I know when we were speaking at the opening reception, you were telling me more about this very dark black that you have in the quilt. Um, and it really is a beautiful fabric. Um, someone is asking, let me see exactly what the question is. Do you think that darks um, and blacks in your quilt are related to hearing of your friend's passing? Um, I don't. I would say not in the way that you might be thinking, because when I was doing this, I had created, I had decided beforehand that I wanted to work with four specific <coughs> value combinations across the entire quilt. Mm -hmm. And in some of them, they're using a, a glowing black and some of them are using a flat black. And that's a Pima text black. And the glowing black is one that Nancy Crow had um, had custom designed, you know, from another company. And so I bought up a hundred yards of that when I, while I had it. And, and um, so, so in the, the process I had said, I'm going to use this glowing black for some of them, and I'm going to use the flat black for some, and it was kind of an equal mix in the initial phase. So it was kind of part of the plan already. And then there are also some darks that I had dyed that were also part of the plan. So, um, so I guess maybe not, but I don't know, but maybe the way that they're kind of, you know, going across the piece in the composition that maybe, you know, I saw, because I do remember seeing um, that and then looking at the other, the other photo of the process where there's some are spots are open, like in the center kind of lower part. I recall that I had to make a number of units to fill in spaces there. And those I did choose to use that system with the black. So maybe on some level, but it wasn't something that I was consciously aware of. It's interesting though, something to think about. Yeah. And you told me that you think this is the end of your mutations series, correct? You know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I <laughs> thought so. I thought that the one after this, it's completely different from this. It's very spare and, you know, has like maybe, five or six colors in it. And at that point, I was kind of like, I didn't know where to go next. So I've come along. So in, besides the one that I showed, the new work, there's another thing that I've been working on and kind of dabbling in. And I'm kind of at a point, like, I don't know if it's really this series or if it's something that's evolved from it because the whole mutation series has stemmed from the idea of taking one design and then changing it and mixing it up in the various units in that composition. And what I'm doing now is more completely improvisationally based. So it's, so in a way I've kind of learned to create these units and it's become kind of habit. And now I'm kind of doing it without using any kind of inspiration as the basis and just kind of doing it freehand and putting in all kinds of other crazy things. So. And I don't know, uh, that one, I don't have an, any pictures to really show of that yet. So, um, but something that's very interesting to me. So I'm not sure, I'll have to wait and see, but I could always come back to this. Yeah, good. Um, we have a question from Patty and she is curious if those of you who have taken a class with Nancy Crow, if you look at your designing differently now, or if you begin to stray back to some ways you did things before her class. 
Well, I'll say I, my work would not be what it is without her. And so, um, but now at the same time, having this year on my own, again, it's caused me to kind of take a step back from her methods and the way she likes us to work and for me to realize what's important to me and what I want to do as I move forward. So this piece that is in Quilt National number 13 is very much an extension, several steps removed from things that she's taught us. It's stuff that she kind of taught us how to see things and do things differently. But what's in this was not something specifically that she taught. So it's kind of changing in a way, which I think happens to most artists, but it was a great launching starting point to get me going. Okay. Uh, Jean, how about you? Well, I didn't had not done very much improvisational quilting until I took a Nancy Crow class and I kind of I took it without really knowing anything about Nancy Crow. I'd gone to a uh, what was called Quilt Fest in Johnson City, Tennessee. And there was a speaker there who, you know, when you have a quilt speaker, they always tell you their life history. And she showed us all her quilts. And when her, she said, okay, so I took a Nancy Crow class and, and then every quilt after that was just so much more interesting. And I went, I left that and told my daughter, well, the only thing I learned from that was that I need to go take a Nancy Crow class. And so then my daughter bugged me until I did. And so, uh, yeah, Nancy definitely helped me to, to do all, all stuff improvisational, pretty much. <laughs> One thing about Nancy that, you know, her classes are really composition classes using fabric in the medium of quilts. It's not, they're not quilting classes. So I think a lot of people show up kind of going to shock, realizing it's a whole different world when you get to the crow barn. But um, but that really is the basis of what she teaches. And I have, you know, I've been to art school and I've learned more about composition through her than I'd ever did in art school. Irene. So I've only taken one class from Nancy Crow. Um, I'm gonna take um, the improv class in a couple of months here, but I only took the strip piecing class. And it really hasn't, affected the way I mean I made a lot of quilts with the leftovers of strip piecing but I actually cut them into kind of and used them as solid fabrics for my pieces and so I don't think it had a huge effect but I'm really looking forward to going back to see what you know what else she can teach me um yeah I went to our school too um and what really fascinates me about Nancy's class is her kind of emphasis on value and so I'm really really interested in that um, to learn that more of that this year and also she talks a lot about figure ground relationships and I'm, I'm really curious to see because we didn't get a lot of that in the strip piecing class so I'm really I think the improv class will be more focused on that so so far I can't say she's had a huge influence on the pieces that I'm making um, but who knows what's going to happen in the future? Sure. Her improv class was a huge turning point for me. Is it, was it? My, it was my second one, and it was a nightmare and at the time. <laughs> but I realized after I came out the other end that it was a huge, it was a huge like eye opener for me. So enjoy. <laughs> oh, I will. I I will. Yeah. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm prepared mentally. <laughs> Probably not physically, but mentally. <laughs> Robbie, how about you? Well, I took a Nancy Crow class when my kids were toddlers. Um, I, they were, and they were 14 months apart. Brian took the kids to Ohio. No, I'm sorry. He took them to Florida. And then I took a class from Nancy. It was a week long thing in, um, Virginia, West Virginia at um, a college. And at that time, well, I smoked a lot. So I kept leaving class to go smoke. So that wasn't that great. I probably just really got <laughs> out of the nerves. And, but I made a couple friends that I've had since then. But the main, and I don't remember what the, the because it literally was 30 years ago. So uh, she was, we were doing something different. We were making the quilt in black and white and then following that in color. I didn't have a lot of fabric at the time, bought a lot of um, solids to use. But the one thing that I came away with that was life-changing for me 
was that I needed a place of my own to work. We had two toddlers. We were in a two bedroom apartment. I'd have to wait till they went to sleep to sew because, you know, I didn't want to sew through their fingers and um, it was too hectic. So when we bought a house, the first thing we did was look for a house that had enough bedrooms that I took over one and I took over the second largest room and let the kids have the two smaller bedrooms and I took over the basement. So that was really life-changing. It was, the quilting was important enough to devote space. We moved out to this, we had been living in the city of Chicago. We moved out to the suburbs far enough out that we could afford to get a big enough house to afford the space for me. And since then, I've never been without some space. We, now we're renting an apartment that has three bedrooms. And again, the second largest bedroom is my studio. And when we had a two bedroom apartment, the second bedroom was my studio. So we've, we've, I've always made room for a studio and I can go in and close the door and lock it if necessary to keep people out and just have time for myself. Oh, that's great. I think a lot of the challenge of being an artist and staying productive is um, allowing yourself to be selfish, you know, and I mean that in a positive way, but to give yourself that time and space alone to think and create. And I know not artists, all artists create alone um, or need necessarily need that space, but it is um, challenging. I, I, that's why I haven't been productive. You know, I, I it's not about me, but <laughs> it's hard for me to find that. Time. <laughs> yeah. 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 So could you, each four of you talk about like, um, how you interact in your studio, what your studio, I mean, you've shown us all a little bit about what your studio looks like, but how do you stay creative? Not how do you stay creative? How do you stay motivated, especially coming out of this year where we were stuck at home? So you had the, probably had the time, but did you have the mental energy and is, was it sustained? How are you feeling now? I'll, I'll go first. Uh, because the hot shops was closed, we had a lock, the outside door was locked. We didn't have visitors as we normally do, which was actually kind of a good thing. Plus I didn't, I just kind of went in um, like a mental fetal position and didn't want to be around other people. And, um, and I was, I think there was a month I didn't come to the studio because I was afraid to. So I, would, I, I don't remember why, uh, why I was afraid. Oh, I guess because of all the germs. But um, anyway, so one thing that I noticed, I have a quote that I can't show you. It's just the top. The colors are so garish that it even annoys me. And and I also got, when I'm, when I'm stressed, I get very, I, w I don't want to say OCD because I read about what that really is, but very picky. And I started satin stitching over the edges of all of my fused pieces. The quilt that is in Quilt National, I did satin stitch over the edge with, I couched um, an embroidery thread down. But other quilts I've made, I've, I, for years, I never did anything to the edges. And all of a sudden during the pandemic, I started covering the edges. And I have a, a piece I'll show you, maybe if I get a chance later, that's based on a mathematical equation. And it's one line that is 900 inches long on a on a 36 by 36 inch quilt and I sat and stitched the entire line of that using two colors so I think during the pandemic I kind of retreated into attention to detail and now I have several tops I need to quilt and um, I'm enjoying being around other people again so I'm not as worried about getting those things done. Usually I'm deadline driven. So, but now I just want to be around people and talk to them and hug them and whether they want it or not. So that's my answer. Jean, how about you? How have you, how have you stayed motivated? I am just a person who's driven <laughs> and I'm <laughs> driven to, to create. So um, I really enjoyed really the pandemic I think affected quilters less than other people because we usually work alone anyway. So um, it was, I didn't have any problems staying motivated. Um, I still had a job while I was doing that. So I was working one to two days a week 
at a nursing home. So I had to be real careful. But uh, when I would be at work, I'd think about what I was going to do at home next. And it's just a nice, it was just a nice break to go from solitude to seeing people and back again. And it made me appreciate um, having the time alone to, to create. <laughs> so yeah, so my kids say that I'm very competitive also. So, and we were given a deadline by Nancy Crow, so I'm working on it. <laughs> I've got my goals. <laughs> Irene, what, um, your quilt is Corona Springs and you talk about the coronavirus in this piece. Um, did you make a whole series of Corona themed or inspired quilts? I did. Uh, once the circle started showing up, it, it kind of stuck. It's actually still in my quilts, but it's kind of changed roles. Um, it turned into kind of a head for figures. So as the, as we, you know, were stuck in our houses and our spaces more and more and more isolated, um, I work in my studio 12 hours a day anyway. I always have my studios where I live. So everything is at, you know, within arm's length from here. And um, because I've always been obsessed and this is kind of what I do all day long, every day anyway. So how it showed up is I started making kind of these figures that uh, one of my students said they're guardians and that's what they are. So I've made these kind of these friends because all my quilts are about the same size as I am. They're about six feet by five feet. And so it was almost <laughs> like I was making friends and making figures to you know relate to as I went. And then they all started kind of shattering, um, that's, you know, pointy things, wedges started showing up. It was like, it was all breaking down and that was kind of closer and to the election. So I think that was more anxiety driven, but not from the pandemic, from politics. And then they've kind of calmed down again. And, but the circle is still there, but it's kind of turned into more of a light. I don't know what to really call it right now, um, but it's huge and it's it's wide and it's got a grid. So it's kind of like a spotlight or something. And so, you know, it's kind of like opening again and maybe hope is there again. I don't know. Um, actually, I've enjoyed being stuck inside all these months and not having to tell people no and being able to just you know, kind of just be here and do what I want to do. And so I do have a high level of anxiety about having to interact with the world again. Um, it, it, you know, I'm fighting it. And but I find my level of anxiety is way back up again. And it's just about Oh my gosh, now I have to, you know, figure out how to get to the airport again. And now I have to figure out how to go grocery shopping again. And so I really liked being kind of nappy, I'm going to say, in this kind of this womb for a year. And it's, it's frightening to me to have to go out in the world again. So I'm working slowly. We'll see. Yeah, good. Slowly. I think that's all right. Um, could the, each, each of you please talk a little bit more about your um, quilting process on your specific piece in Quilt National? <clears throat> Michael, would you like to speak about yours a bit? Sure. Um, and also, on, as far as staying motivated over the last year, I, uh, I had that deadline from Nancy for the first half of last year. And it kind of coincided when I kind of hit the wall, as I mentioned on the piece after this one, and also realizing that the deadline wasn't there, that I just kind of gave myself the time to explore other things that I wanted to put into my work that wasn't um, driven by um, this kind of work, kind of stemming several steps off of a design exercise from Nancy. So, um, so that kind of, it, it shifted the, the feeling for me for a while. And then it was a matter of kind of coming through that and figuring out, okay, like, where is this going to lead? And so those um, ruler edge pieces were the first ones. Um, those, I've done six, six or seven um, of the ruler-based pieces. 
And then um, this is a big one that I'm doing now. So I'm kind of coming out of that. And I've also realized in the last couple of months that I just need to take a break from my studio because mm -hmm. I've been here and other than going to the opening for Quilt National that um, I haven't really been around. You know, that was the first venture out of over a year of being kind of shut in. And so I was kind of thrown into the fire of being back in the public and interacting with people, but it was, it was good. I enjoyed it. So I've just, it's taken me a long time to make progress on this piece. So I'm taking my time with that. Um, as far as the quilting on this, it's um, fairly pretty simple. I have on most of my quilts, I do horizontal or vertical line stitching about three eighths of an inch apart. I use the superior mono poly hundred weight clear polyester thread on the top and then a superior bottom line thread on the back. And for me, because I put so much emphasis on the piecing and all of the colors that I put in, I don't want to have the quilting as an additional layer of design. So for me, it's just easier just to have, you know, just that evenness of the quilting and also with a very thin thread that doesn't really um, distract the viewer's eye and lets them go right into the, the piece. And that's, that's kind of what I'm doing with a lot of these types of pieces now. It may change down the road. Uh, does anyone else want to share about your quilting? Well, mine's just kind of like Michael's is. I just do quarter inch and I just change directions. I use a usually a very, you know, 50 weight white poly because my machine doesn't like cotton. It breaks it. So it prefers something stronger. Um, and I just kind of get to each, each section and just kind of quilt in the direction it wants to go. Um, lately, I've been actually playing a lot more with var variegated threads and using it kind of on top of the other colors to maybe add another more, you know, keep it not so flat. But generally, I just do very simple quarter inch apart quilting that I don't I kind of want it, I want texture, but I don't want it to add confusion. Mm -hmm. Jean, what about yours? Um, I also use straight line quilting on this and it's about a quarter inch apart, I think. And I use RF fill. I think I used a, um, I mean, it's been a while since I've seen the quilt, but I think it's an orange, a very light orange because I wanted the warmth to th show through. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm before and after doing straight line, I've done some just following echo quilting and all and enhancing when I do botanical garden type quilts, I do enhancing the leaves and things like that. But uh, I saw so I switch back and forth. Robbie, how about you? You're muted, Robbie. I can't remember how I quilted it. But um, I usually, <laughs> I usually I kind of, I, I quilt with the same color thread on the color that I'm quilting on. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is hold the pieces together with the quilting because usually they're fused mm -hmm. and the quilting is what holds the fused piece on. In this case, I did cover all of the edges, I think. I'm not sure about the black part. I think that I didn't even quilt the black spaces. Um, I do a lot of spirals because I like spirals. And um, I think on the stripey parts, I followed the contours of the lines. It's all very, even though my quilts themselves are, are planned, the quilting itself is pretty improvisational. I don't choose what I'm going to do until I'm addressing each section and I work mostly from the center out even though I'm on a long arm with rails and I mount the quilt a uh, long way. Uh, I mount it horizontally no matter how the quilt's going to come out so there's less turning. Hmm. And so I work on the long arm I work from the top to the bottom. If I'm working on a sit down machine I work from the center out and it's that's pretty intuitive and then afterwards I don't remember anything of what I did it's just I was in the moment it yeah. was intuitive yes yeah <laughs> cool um Irene your piece I don't know if I have a question about this uh, as much as a comp 
a comment. What I like about this work and a few of your other pieces is how you use your binding to um, keep the viewer's eye bouncing around the piece and moving around and you give the space where you have the white um, negative space, including in the binding. And it kind of gives your eye the freedom to focus in that big circle. And then you have that big maroon square in there, but also pulls you around and then out. Yeah, when I teach, it's one of we do binding because, I mean, briefly, because it's one more last decision to make on what your quilt's going to look like, whether you face it or enclose it with a frame by just regular binding. But I love in some quilts, they just need another something. And so this one definitely did. I, you know, so I fussy cut bindings um, when they're needed, but I don't decide how I'm going to find it until it's on the wall quilted squared up ready to go and then I'll look at it and go what does it need and then I'll make that decision as you know right before I do it but this one needed color along the edges mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think with the color so centralized that it um pulls it pulls your eye around it otherwise I don't know that I would be focusing as much on the the um hand-drawn little elements in the top left corner and you know things like that as much it, it really completes the piece I think I mean of course I didn't see it without the binding but <laughs> good um so do the four of you have questions for each other I have a question or two for Michael mm -hmm. uh, first of all can I come live in your basement <laughs> <laughs> Because those are the two things I cannot have in my space is a long arm and a dye studio. And I'm going, that would be perfect and space. Um, so yeah, I need to come live there. I don't care if it's cold and damp. And <laughs> the other thing is on the piece that you made, not your strip piecing, but the one that's in the show, did you make all of those elements first and then cut them down to size as you arrange them? Um, so you had them all sitting around somewhere and you could try them out or do you make them as you go? I made the, in the process picture that I showed you that had all the blank, they were just kind of arranged. That was the first round. So that was my initial plan. I had taken pieces of that original design and then I kind of made up a, a grid, like, you know, this design with this value system and kind of made a variety across all of those and then I put those up on the wall and then so as I was making them my walls the design wall wasn't put together in the in the one big piece it was those two sections like that other shot that I showed earlier so I was working on one design element from that initial inspiration at a time and then doing multiple values in there. And I had big stacks of fabric on my table that were just pulled out by value. So I don't even remember I just, I pulled fabrics by value. And then when I needed that value, I pulled the stack over and I would kind of look at what I had made before to see what colors I had chosen. And sometimes I would repeat them. And then other times I'd pull in something new. So the first round was just kind of totally random. And then the second round to fill in the blanks was more um, planned in that way. But yeah, so for most of it, I just start with something. I start making units and I have no idea where it's going to go. And that's the same thing with the piece I'm currently working on. I just made triangles and a range of values and combinations. And now I'm filling in the blanks. Cool. Irene, where do you store your quilts? <laughs> uh well, right now I have um, some plastic containers in my car. Um, and other than that, I have a carport that is accessible that I can get um, to. And I have them in cabinets out there, um, but they're not very well protected, uh, climatized. So I'm thinking about, I'm just going to have to go rent a storage space because it seems that they're not diminishing. 
um, they keep the whole collections keep growing. And so <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to have to go get a fairly good size storage space and just start. But it's so nice to have them handy where I can just, you know, go out and grab one if I need to, to put a sleeve on or take photographs of, but I'm taking, I've had an exhibition at the, um, the library here downtown closing next week. And that's 20 more quilts I have to go pick up. And so I'm thinking, yeah, it's gonna be a storage space soon. Okay. Can't stop making. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Robbie, you had a question? Yes, I had a couple. Um, Irene, I was wondering if when you start on a quilt, if you've already made that first element or do you sit down and make an element and say, this will be the first one? And how do you get started with that first element? I don't think about it. I look around when I'm starting a new quilt, I just look around the room and there could be an element, I call them components, left over from another quilt that's sitting there that I go through my you know stack of kind of rejects and I'll stick it in the middle of the wall. Or if I've you know got some brand new colors that I haven't played with before, I will cut a piece off of it. Um, uh, a lot of times, you know, it's just picking up something that's sitting around and just sticking them up there and just seeing where it leads me. And that way I never have to pre-plan or think about it. And it's really kind of fun just to see what happens next. And so, yeah, I, something sitting around usually. Ah, that's, that's good to know. I have a box of all my spare parts. But you said <laughs> To me, I can start a new, I can start using your spare parts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then um, am I allowed to ask another question? Sure. Sure. Okay. This is also for Irene. Um, oh, the, and the quilt, your quilt national quilt, I see a woman in there and you were saying that you have your friends and she's very um, friendly and protective. To me, it looks like that's her, the circle, there's her head and she has some curls. Yeah. And things, do you, when you're working on these, does the name, do you see the person as you're working on it? And if, do the, do you, is that, do you see that woman and does she have a name? <laughs> no, she doesn't have a name. <laughs> um, if you look at all of my quilts, I think you will see figures in most of them. Um, mm -hmm. I am very much love portraiture. I love people. Um, and they do tend to show up a lot in my quilts. I mean, and I don't know, what am I doing? Am I making, is it a mirror? Maybe, I don't know, in which case we know what its name would be. But <laughs> I mean, in this one, I think, you know, I can't say that I didn't realize that this was a figure because of course it kind of, you know, I've got these little kind of sticky out arms here and this is definitely, you know, would be a head. Um, but I think if you look at most of my quilts, you will see that there is a figure, a main figure in them. Can't help it. That's just kind of what happens. No. Yeah. I was looking at your quilts the other day and I, I didn't see that. I must not have been paying a lot of attention or I got distracted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I just wanted Michael uh, to ask Michael what kind of washing machines those are that he, that he has. Oh. I know it's they're um, two of the small ones are from a company called Panda and they're a large capacity machine and I don't think they make those anymore. So that's why I switched to those other wider ones, which are a brand called Costway and they're portable washing machines. I think they have their advertisers holding 11 pounds of clothes. And um, so I can do four yards at a time in them. They, that works really well for that. I could probably push it to six if I needed to but four works well for me. Do you have to run them through it multiple times to rinse them? I rinse in buckets and then um, the rinse out doesn't, it's not that bad. So I, I use the buckets for rinsing out. I only use those washers for the dye bath. And then oh. I, um, as part of my washout though, for one of the problems I've had over the years is with reds and super dark um, highly saturated fabrics to tend to bleed when I'm, especially when I'm ironing and it gets really hot and then it releases some dye. So 
I actually have an outdoor, I have two burners outside. And so I will boil the fabric if it's red or really saturated to release as much dye as I can. And then I put it through my washer on a sanitary cycle with, and I have Synthropol in outside in the pots and also in the, the washer. And I rarely have problems now with that. Oh, that's good. That's good to know because that has become a problem for me every once in a while. Thanks. Yeah. A lot of my colleagues also use hot sticks, like an electronic um, thing that you can stick in a, in a plastic bucket and get it up to a high temp. Oh, mm. thank you. <laughs> Always a solution. <laughs> Jean, I had a question for you. Maybe you answered this and I missed it. Um, the design in this quilt, um, is this a motif that you use in another in other quilts? Is this one a part of a series? You're you're muted. Muted. Jean, you're muted still. Doesn't. Okay. Yeah, I pro I probably made four or five quilts using that motif. And so this was probably the fourth out of those, I think. And I mean, I've had several in shows, so it was a successful one. I should probably make some more. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah, it is a fun quilt. Like, um, I don't know. I think the name is very appropriate. You can definitely see the, the dance of not only the figure, but the color and movement in the quilt too. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, we're almost out of time. We have a few more minutes. If anyone has any final comments or questions for the artist, you can go ahead and ask them now, drop them in the box or shout them out if you'd like. I do have a question for Jean. So Jean, you have a motif in this quilt that you said you've used quite a bit. And then on the one behind you, you also seem to have a, a, a motif. Do you kind of choose a motif and then do a series and change the scale of those and the arrangements for each new quilt? Or how do you kind of build your quilts? Uh, well, I, I do kind of just exactly what you said. I use the same motif and I change the scale. And uh, sometimes I can combine two motifs together. Like this was a sketch out of my sketchbook. And then I took the same or part of it and I've made several other quilts using the thing that looks like an oval with two branches. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for sharing. I really appreciate you all taking your time uh, to speak with us today. Um, other things for the Dairy Barn, we have a few classes taught by Quilt National Artists that will be happening um, in the coming weeks. And you can find more information about those at dairybarn.org. The Quilt National 21 catalog is now available for purchase and you can purchase it online also on our website. Um, and this um, artist talk event will continue happening every Friday. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, until Labor Day weekend. Um, and so the registration for the following Fridays will open up ASAP, hopefully by the end of the day. And hopefully we won't have any um, Zoom link snap foos any, anymore. Um, so thank you all for your patience and for joining us. And I apologize for anyone who joined late. This video will be uploaded to YouTube. And um, if you registered, that means I have your email address and you'll receive notification of when these artist videos artist Q&A talk videos are uploaded and you can watch them back. So thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.